You. You are not smoking. Start now. Wake up. Look, Look at the, the screen. screen. Smoke. Light up. Smoke now. You look great. Take a look. Trust us. It's the business of the tobacco industry to depict people looking good as cigarette smokers. Young people are the likely targets of advertisements, and they are responding. Americans are starting to smoke at younger and younger ages. And yet cigarette packages warn against the hazards of smoking. Medical experts agree that smoking causes lung cancer and numerous other illnesses. Now, saying that one thing causes another is quite a strong statement in scientific terms. And in statistics, we have to be especially careful. Here's the crux of the problem. Causation is often confused with association. Association means that two variables have a strong observed connection. But a strong connection does not mean that one variable necessarily results from another variable. When we misinterpret association as causation, we can reach some bizarre conclusions. We'll illustrate this with a light example. The population of Louisiana has been increasing at a rate of about 48,000 people per year since 1970. At the same time, the state's land mass is decreasing at the rate of 17.5 square miles a year. Can we say that the increased weight of all these people is causing the state to sink into the bayou? Hardly. Increased population is caused by, among other things, increases in the number of jobs available in the state. Land settling is a geological process. Even though changes in the two variables are observed simultaneously, they are not causally related. In this unit, we'll try to explain associations that are observed while being careful not to claim causation where it doesn't exist. We'll see how an association can often be explained by another variable lurking in the background. And we'll show how we get good evidence that a strong association between two variables really is causal even when we can't do an experiment. Here's an association, a little known piece of beach trivia. Ice cream sales are positively associated with the number of drownings. In other words, as ice cream sales go up, so do the number of drownings. How do we explain this? Well, it could be that big globs of cold ice cream in the stomach cause bodies to sink in water. Another explanation might be that onlookers console themselves by eating all the ice cream in sight. Is there a better explanation? Ice cream really has nothing to do with why people drown. There are common but hidden factors here. The temperature and the beach population. On a hot day, more people go to the beach. More ice cream is sold and more people drown, simply because there are more swimmers. We call the weather and the number of people on the beach lurking variables, hidden factors that influence both ice cream sales and drownings. What does this have to do with smoking? Well, a strong association exists between smoking and lung cancer, and it seems like it's causal. How can we know that some other set of lurking variables is not responsible for the association? The best way to make a case for causation is to conduct an experiment. An experiment imposes some treatment in order to observe its effects. In the case of smoking, subjects would be assigned at random to two groups, those who are told to smoke and those who are told not to. And then cancer rates between the two groups can be compared at the end. Here's a possible experimental procedure. Visit a nearby nursery and choose two groups of newborns at random. Half of the infants you hook up to smoking machines and force them to puff away. The other half you install in an identical environment, but you forbid them to smoke. You control the behavior of these subjects over the next 30 years. At the end of the study, you compare the rates of lung cancer in the two groups. You can be confident that whatever differences that exist between the two groups can be attributed to smoking. Why not do this? Well, obviously, it's unethical. You can't force people to do things that are potentially damaging to them. If we can't conduct an experiment, how is it that we've come to say that smoking causes lung cancer? Well, many strands of evidence emerged over a long period of time. Amidst a fierce battle between the medical establishment and the tobacco industry over interpretation of the findings. Smoke, smoke, smoke 
smoke yourself to death. St. Peter at the Golden Gate Bet you hate to make you wait You just gotta have another cigarette Cigarette smoking became increasingly popular in America after World War I when cigarettes were handed out to soldiers as a way to boost morale. Per person consumption rose from 49 cigarettes in 1900 to 611 cigarettes in 1920. But along with a rise in smoking came a disturbing rise in the lung cancer rates and some early warnings from a handful of doctors. One of these doctors was a young lung surgeon, Richard Overholt. He noticed that his non-smoking surgery patients had a higher survival rate and a quicker recovery rate than the smokers. He tried to get his colleagues to encourage their patients to quit. I could share the doctors were smokers. They didn't believe this. And it was very difficult to convince people that this was doing damage to them because they felt that they were getting pleasure from smoking. During the 30s and 40s, the popularity of cigarette smoking soared as the new image of the smoker took hold. Little thought was given to the risk. But in the early 40s, new studies sounded a louder alarm on the dangers of smoking. One of the earliest and most compelling of these was a retrospective study that was conducted by Ernst Winder and his teacher, Everts Graham. A retrospective study looks back at events that have already taken place. In these studies, patients were separated into two groups, those with cancer and those without. Both groups were asked the same questions about their past habits. Responses from the two groups were compared to see which habits distinguished cancer patients from non-patients. Smoking stood out. My junior year in medical school, I uh, developed a questionnaire. I began to ask lung cancer patients about the smoking and other habits, and I then did controls, and it was quite apparent that lung cancer patients smoked much more than the controls, and that, in fact, lung cancer in those that never smoked was quite a rare disease. Dr. Winder, then a student at St. Louis, under Dr. Ewerts Graham, came to me and he said, Camel cigarettes cause cancer of the lung. I couldn't believe it. And you know, you see what you look for and you look for what you know, and it never occurred to me that cigarettes caused cancer. So we went to see my patients, and at that time I had quite a large practice. We discovered to our amazement that patients who had cancer of the lung were 17 times to one as apt to be two pack a day smokers. So here was a fact trying to tell us something. Despite the remarkable discrepancy in smoking habits between cancer and non-cancer patients, a retrospective study was not good enough. Because the study looked at past behavior, behavior it could not control, it's possible that the lung cancer was due to lurking variables. We are only looking at statistical correlation we're looking at it in the crudest possible way because we don't have a defined sample from a defined population. We don't have a clear way to measure differential rates of disease or of smoking because we have targets of opportunity in terms of the people that happen to have lung cancer and be in that hospital. And so we can go only so far with a retrospective study and no further. Finally, in the 50s, large prospective studies were set up. A prospective study looks ahead. Like an experiment, it compares smokers and non-smokers and follows them forward to compare cancer rates. It's not an experiment, though, because people choose whether or not they want to smoke. An experiment requires that subjects be assigned to each group. Doctors Hammond and Horn of the American Cancer Society conducted one of the first prospective studies on smoking. About 200,000 people were given a smoking questionnaire and then followed for four years, an expensive endeavor. The death rates and cause of death for smokers and non-smokers were compared. The preliminary study published in 1954 caused quite a sensation. It was the largest study on smoking that had been done. It was the first prospective study that had been published and it showed that uh, people who smoke cigarettes have a lung cancer rate ten times as high as people who never smoke and that the risk goes up proportionately according to the amount of number of cigarettes 
that people smoke per day. This high correlation was consistent with the findings of the retrospective studies, but there was still disagreement about how to explain the correlation. There is a set of third variables that is accounting for this uh, correlation between smoking and lung cancer. This kind of thing is not at all uncommon. There are many examples in the statistical literature where two variables are highly correlated with one another and yet one does not cause the other. To tackle the problem of lurking variables, doctors Hammond and Horn designed a follow-up study of one million people. The smokers and non-smokers were matched on such variables as age, geography, and occupation. The goal was to make smoking habits the only major difference between the two groups. And we matched them on 19 different variables, so they were as alike as we could make. And when we finished the, this analysis, the death rate of the smokers was higher than the death rate of the non-smokers. Even though the two groups were as similar as possible, they were not identical. What if smokers differed genetically from non-smokers in a way that both caused them to smoke and caused them to get lung cancer? This objection was stated most forcefully by Sir Ronald Fisher, at the time the world's foremost statistician. Without a controlled experiment, he argued, there was no way to know whether the lung cancer was due to smoking or to another uncontrolled variable. So despite the accumulating evidence from dozens of prospective and retrospective studies, for many scientists and statisticians, the label of causation was still premature. So they turned to the lab for help. Throughout the 50s and 60s, biochemical and animal studies provided compelling supporting evidence. Tar was painted on mouse skin and rabbit ears, and cancerous tumors developed. And the presence of carcinogens in tobacco smoke was demonstrated. Another aspect of the prospective studies that was confirmed in the lab was the dose-response relationship. By exposing hamsters to cigarette smoke, it was possible to determine that the more smoke a hamster is exposed to, the more likely it was to get lung cancer. So you have carcinogen tobacco smoke. It is proved to be carcinogenic to animal tissue. It is highly correlated in retrospective and prospective studies in respect to cancer of the lung in humans. And that was more than sufficient to establish tobacco smoke as a cause of lung cancer and subsequently other cancers in humans. For some, the evidence was sufficient. But the struggle to prove causation to a nation of smokers was not over. From 1940 to 1960, per-person consumption had again doubled. And the tobacco industry had become a powerful force to be reckoned with, both politically and economically. The tobacco companies did not ignore the growing evidence that cigarettes posed a serious risk to health. They responded by devising clever advertisements to diffuse the issue. One of the things that the industry attempted to do was to call into question the very validity of statistical and epidemiological thinking as it relates to the health risks of the cigarette. So what they often said to people is, test for yourself. See if you can use our cigarette and you experience less throat irritation. And what this really did was say, don't look at the data, look at individual experience. Well, statisticians know that individual experience can be um, quite um, antithetical to what we know about what the large patterns are. In 1962, the Surgeon General assembled an advisory committee on smoking and health. Its task was formidable. To review more than 6,000 retrospective, prospective, and laboratory studies on smoking. The goal was to take on the question of causation. The findings were made public in the Surgeon General's report. The committee concluded that the strong association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer was found in many studies with many different groups of people. The association was very strong. Cancer regularly followed smoking in time. Studies showed that smoke did contain cancer-causing substances and no explanation other than causation was plausible. It was an historic verdict. The committee states on page 61 of the report, and I quote, In view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is a judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. In the wake of the Surgeon General's report, 
millions of Americans quit smoking. Congress passed a law requiring warnings on cigarette packs. Cigarette ads were banned from television. The anti-smoking movement as we now know it was born. The scientific consensus was in. Smoking does cause lung cancer. <laughs> But to this day, the tobacco industry keeps the debate alive, leaning heavily on one idea. Statistical associations are not always causal. Well, this is a very complex question. Statistics cannot prove... Cannot prove... Cannot prove a causal relationship between smoking and disease. This is a very, very complex question. We're accused of trying to get people to start smoking. We don't. We don't. We don't. It's always been our policy that young people should not smoke, shouldn't smoke. The evidence about the risks of smoking falls short of the high standards set by good experiments. But it's about as strong as non-experimental evidence can be. In this unit, we've learned that not all associations can be explained by cause and effect. But some can be. And with enough evidence from enough different sources, we can be confident in our conclusions.